I'm angry. Yes, I am outraged. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. I like to watch porn. Like, what girls in here like porn? Thank you. I love it. All the, all the whores are in the front. This is the best. Probably go to, you know, hundreds of award ceremonies and no. or no award ceremonies. <laughs> Whatever I do or I'm kind of stuck there. Yeah, um, like an event of some kind. An event. Yeah. And, you, and you see the speeches and I'm always struck by the fact that you know, women accept awards and the first thing they do quite often is apologize. They apologize for not being funny. They apologize for not being articulate. Um, they apologize for, you know, this isn't going to be a good speech. I yeah. wonder what you make of that. Where did we, how did we get to that place? I think because so many people hate women. There's so much anger toward women. Um, I had to work to stop doing that. I'd be on set and I'd want to give a suggestion to, uh, when we were filming Trainwreck to, to Judd, Apatow and I, I'd say sorry, uh, and then I was like, I just noticed. I'm like, what am I doing? So I just made sure to not. Do you talked yourself out of it. Yeah, became a conscious yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's out of my system now. I say I'm sorry a lot less than I probably should. If you say the name Hillary Clinton, you know, in America, yeah. you get incredible responses. There'll be those who love her, and there'll be those with visceral hatred on well, their faces. Well, that's what I'm saying with the not being informed, because those people aren't informed. You know, they, if you go, why don't you like Hillary? They'll go, she lied about her emails. What else is she gonna lie about? So, um, and I don't think you can have a, I haven't had a conversation with anyone who doesn't like Hillary where they've had anything meaningful to say. Ryan Gosling, like all the nicest people is Canadian. <laughs> and Dev Patel was born in Kenya raised in London, and is here for playing an Indian raised in Tasmania. So Hollywood is crawling with outsiders and foreigners. And if we kick them all out, you'll have nothing to watch but football and mixed martial arts, which are not the arts. If you really uh, look at who follows the UFC and is into mixed martial arts, it's everybody. Uh, you know, um, I, I, like I said, I, I, I don't expect an 80-year-old woman to be a big fan of mixed martial arts. Um, and listen, you know, everybody's into whatever. They're, I'm not a big fan of golf. Doesn't mean people should stop watching it. Uh, if you don't like it, change the channel. Is it an art? Oh, of course it's an art. I mean, the, these fighters, the men and women are so talented that, you know, they train their whole lives to, to become the best in the world. And, and the people who get into the UFC are the elite of the elite. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's saying something stupid like that is, is like saying that, you know, she's not a talented actress, which she is. Who's to know if your soul will fade at all? The one you sold to fool the world. You lost your self-esteem along the way yeah. Good God, you're coming up with reasons Good God, you're dragging it out Good God, it's the changing of the seasons I feel so raped, so follow me down And just fake it if you're out of direction Fake it if you don't belong here Fake it if you feel like Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. According to rules set by the candidates themselves, each man shall make an opening statement of approximately eight minutes duration and a closing statement of approximately three minutes duration. In between, the candidates will answer or comment upon answers to questions put by a panel of correspondents. 
In this, the first discussion in a series of four joint appearances, the subject matter has been agreed will be restricted to internal or domestic American matters. And now for the first opening statement by Senator John F. Kennedy. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free, whether it will move in the direction of freedom, in the direction of the road that we are taking, or whether it will move in the direction of slavery. This debate may have been well forgotten about a long time ago. But everyone knows that Richard Nixon lost to JFK in the 1960 election. The thing is, many people don't really realize part of the reason why. Everyone simply assumes that JFK was just simply less robotic and more fun to be around. There is some truth to this, but a lot of people forget that almost everyone who heard JFK on the radio said he lost, while everyone who saw him on TV said he won. In other words, there was something about his body language, the fact that he was willing to wear makeup, and all sorts of other things that made JFK skyrocket past Richard Nixon. The thing is, fame will always bring you down if you let it consume you. As we all know, the Kennedys have not been short of scandal, especially JFK himself, Robert Kennedy, and many other Kennedys who have had quite the influence from women and drugs. Many people forget that the biggest reason why JFK won is because the Democrats have done one thing very, very well. They've used the entertainment industry to their advantage. When you do this, it allows you to then manipulate people that much easier. Six minutes and about 20 seconds. In a little over six minutes, 17 of our friends were taken from us, 15 were injured, and everyone, absolutely everyone, in the Douglas community was forever altered. Everyone who is there understands. Everyone who has been touched by the cold grip of gun violence understands. For us, long, tearful, chaotic hours in the scorching afternoon sun were spent not knowing. No one understood the extent of what had happened. No one could believe that there were bodies in that building waiting to be identified for over a day. No one knew that the people who were missing had stopped breathing long before any of us had even known that a code red had been called. No one could comprehend the devastating aftermath or how far this would reach or where this would go. For those who still can't comprehend because they refuse to, I'll tell you where it went right into the ground, six feet deep. Six minutes and 20 seconds with an AR-15, and my friend Carmen would never complain to me about piano practice. The girl that you were just looking at is known as Emma Gonzalez. She was one of the people who went to Stone Douglas High. At a very young and ignorant age of 17, she wants to take your guns. She wants to have gun control. She may be young, but that doesn't necessarily mean she doesn't have a brain. However, she still has the ability to be wrong, as so many people are about gun control. But this entire clip doesn't seem genuine, does it? Who's pulling this girl's strings? After all, anyone who is logical would tell her that guns are not the problem. Let's take a look at that. Thank you, students, and everyone here for standing up and saying no more. Because we know it's hard and we know they will twist our words and laugh at us and lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. How do they sleep at night? You are killing children and they call people like me Hollywood liberals, like there's something in it for us. Well, what's in it for us is knowing we're doing our part to keep our children alive. A little about me. I took Plan B about 10 days ago. Um, thank you. Oh my God, you guys. Only clap if you mean it. Uh, I did. You know, you know what it is? There's some people here. It's the morning after pill. I take it the night before because I'm smart. But 
some people like to, I'm with you good people. I believe birth begins at conception. So I just like beat that shit. Huh? Speaking up about this puts literal targets on our backs. And for sick bullying and lies about us, and it narrows the people who will support our work. We sell half as many tickets because we're standing up for what's right. Amy Schumer revealed her sense of entitlement in November 2015 when she was caught playing the Do You Know Who I Am card with someone who, well, didn't know who she was. Page Six reported that the comedian refused to check into the Upper West Side Equinox gym, telling staff, quote, I'm famous. A source told Page Six she felt entitled to just walk in. She didn't want to show her key fob and wanted to be able to go in and not be questioned. It narrows the people. And, and you see that, politicians? You can make a little less money and be able to look at yourself in the mirror with no blood on your hands. The National Rifle Association, or NRA, gets all of its funding from membership dues. In order to be a member, you simply need to pay a membership fee. There are over 10 million members of the NRA, all who are individual gun owners. <laughs> We are fighting for the survival of innocent victims. But you're too busy counting money and hating anyone who disagrees with you. I don't think you can have a... I haven't had a conversation with anyone who doesn't like Hillary where they've had anything meaningful to say. To realize that you are digging the graves of the people that you are sworn to protect. Guns! The loud killer! Or why you should support gun control and why the only people who don't want restrictions on the Second Amendment are child-killing right-wing bigots! There are plenty of NRA members and gun owners who want sensible gun laws. I applaud them and I stand with them. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones who ignore the halls of the schools filling with blood and tears and pictures of the children who should still be with us. So I never knew where we stood in the socioeconomic order. That's why I like making movies about underdogs. The imitation game, you know, the king's speech, the stuttering king, you know, the lion. To me, I'm still the underdog. I felt that way. Right what do we have to do here? Nothing. I'm going to take a shower. You sit there and have a drink. Water. Don't drink. Uh, can I stay water. on the bar? No. You must come here now. No. Please. No, I don't want to. I'm not doing anything with you. I'm I know. I'm embarrassing you. I'm not sorry. I, I don't come in here. No, yesterday was a kind of aggressive for me. I, know. I need to know a person to I be touched. I won't do a thing. I don't want to. 
everything, please. I swear I won't. Just sit with me. Don't embarrass me in the hotel. I'm here all the time. I sit know, with me, but I, I promise. Don't want to. Please sit there. Please. One minute. No, I ask I can't. You. Go to the bathroom. Please, I don't want to do something I don't want go to. Go to the bathroom. Hey, come here. Listen to me. I want to go downstairs. I'm not going to do anything. And you'll never see me again after this. Okay? That's it. If you don't, if you embarrass me in this hotel, I'm not embarrassing stay. you. Just it's just walk. that I don't I don't feel comfortable. I mean, don't have a fight with me. It's before. not mine. Nice. Please, I'm not going to do anything. I swear, my children, please come in. On everything, I'm a famous I'm, guy. I'm feeling please, very uncomfortable right please now. Please come in now, and one minute. And if you want to leave, when the guy comes with my Why jacket, you can go. you touch my breast? Oh, please, I'm sorry. Just come on. I'm used to that. But are you used please. to that? Child yeah, abuse yeah, is obviously a symptom of a lot more. And what is it a symptom of, exactly? It's very, very simple. We have to understand psychology. More specifically, we have to understand why people believe that they are above consequence. Everyone behaves to a certain degree, but most people behave because there are consequences. And you can feel and see those consequences right away. Unfortunately, especially in women, they tend to not feel responsible for their own actions because they're not always held to the same standards as men. In this case, all people in Hollywood are like this. Think about it. Their entire job description reads that your skill is to pretend and behave bizarrely in front of a recording device that can visually and audibly record you. Naturally, people like this are not going to behave themselves. They have no proportion. They're very out of touch. It's a trope that's been going on for a long time, and we all know of it. We all know that most celebrities don't really have much of a touch with reality. Why? Because their job is actually not that hard. It's a skill, and I respect them for it, and it can be learned by just about anyone. But it's not something impossible. If you exist, there's probably a role, as long as you're good at acting, for you somewhere. Yet these people make billions of dollars every single year. Same thing with athletes. Athletes are a little more down to earth because if they don't win, they don't play. But with that being said, they are paid to play a game. So imagine what this does for the psyche. Imagine what this does for holding down reality. Their entire job description reads, you should pretend to believe things that in real life you may not actually believe. You'll get paid lots and lots of money for this, and you will become loved by everyone around you. Do you think that breeds people who are down to earth, who are intelligent? Child abuse is normal in Hollywood because you're not dealing with people who have a grip on reality. Abuse of usury is regular in Hollywood. Usury being when you used a higher position to somebody else to get what you want from them. Essentially, extortion and coercion. It's normal because this is the type of environment they have. I'm going to quickly show you a clip that shows what I'm talking about and how most people in Hollywood are not nice, but they're polite. And remember, a nice person is someone who genuinely, whether they are polite about it or not, does good things for other people because they care. A polite person is just someone who doesn't offend with words. And there is a very, very toxic and important difference between the two. Anyway, we appreciate that your time is less than limited, so I'll cut to the chase. Logline. The ring meets the godfather. Wise guy. Murdered, I guess you could say. Seeks revenge on the man who ordered it. You would play that man. Which man? Who are we kidding you? Ben Kingsley. You play the boss. I heard this idea. I call Jay and I say, Sir Ben Kingsley, no one else. Well, you know, as ever, it's script dependent. Oh, we got a sensational writer, J.T. Dole. I'm embarrassed. I haven't heard of him. He's from TV. Uh, Nash Bridges, Hooperman, Law and Order, the SUV. So there's a script? We wanted to surmise your interest and then tailor the part to your specificities. No one plays a tough, ruthless, hard-hearted prick like you do. You got it down, trust me. I take that as quite a compliment. Sure, sexy beast. Now, we do have a short list of directors. We could go A-list down the horror genre, Ridley, 
Poe Pooper, or we could try to find the next James Wan. He did Saw. Did you see that? Fucking brutal. Betty, it's Ben. How are you? What on earth are you doing out here? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce Miss Lauren McCall. Lauren, this is Carmine Tazzi and Christopher... Multisante. Huge fan. Thank you. Looper Tazzi. You were great in the haves and have-nots. Oh, yes, dear Howard Hawks. Thank you. I'm a presenter at one of these award shows. Uh, show West, some bullshit. Well, I did one of those. Years ago, after Death and the Maiden, I think. They do take good care of you, though. I have a shotsu in about ten minutes. Wow. But let's, let's catch up. Absolutely. Great to see you. Thank you. As always. So nice meeting both of you. Enjoy your success. Uh, that reminds me, I have a scheduling problem. This meeting was last minute, and I'm supposed to be at the um, luxury lounge at 2. Yeah, but we haven't even gone to the particulars yet. We'll walk with you. I think this is going very well. You okay? You seem a bit distracted. It's fucking Sir Ben Kingsley, so... Lauren Bacall. That was a clip from the show The Sopranos. And if you weren't paying attention, the idea behind what you just saw was simple. When people are pathologically polite, they don't actually mean most of what they say. And this pathological politeness usually comes from the fact that you were dealing with people who have never built a chair, they have never learned how to weld anything, they have never learned any software programming, they have never learned martial arts, and if they have, it's usually for one movie and they kind of know it, but not really, in most of its special effects. These are people who essentially haven't been in a situation where real life smacks them in the face and forces them to deal with it. These people essentially live in a bubble. They live in a world where they believe that everything is going to be the same all the time because they are Robert Downey Jr. or they are Keegan-Michael Key or Jordan Peele. They are one of these people. These people who don't really come up with the real world. They never actually have done a real job and if they have, they're older gentlemen that have done it so many years ago that they didn't really learn anything from it. That's why sexual abuse is so easily seen in places like this. Because you're not dealing with people who have had real life experiences, who understand that their actions have consequences. These are overly polite sociopaths who essentially got famous and became billionaires all by pretending to be things that they really weren't. You have to understand that this is the pathological way that they function. So when you look at somebody like this, when you see why they would want to ban guns despite the fact that if you are being attacked, you need a gun to defend yourself if you're a disabled person, if you're a small woman facing a very large roided up man, and if, just pick a number of situations where you're outmatched by some kind of drunk, drug addict nut job. At any time that could happen. That's why these people are so toxic. When it comes to the psychology of most of these people, fame is what destroys them. There are some people in Hollywood who are famous who don't do this kind of stuff. I would have to say that Keanu Reeves definitely fits that mold. He openly gives away most of his stuff, and believe it or not, he actually rides the bus most places because he doesn't like the idea of being paid millions of dollars to act. There's nothing wrong with being paid a decent amount of money for to be an actor. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of people admire your work, especially if you're an actor. Actors do have a skill and it's very entertaining. But when we go into this pathological place where we start worshiping these people as if they're gods, as if these human beings of flesh and blood who entertain us, that's the key thing. They entertain us, become gods in our eyes where are we really headed as a society what about doctors what about firemen what about police what about soldiers what about scientists what about engineers what about all these people who actually do something wrong right you know something amazing if i met some of the actors that i'm a fan of i'd probably get along with them pretty well because, for one thing, they're overly pathologically polite, and I'm not that kind of a person, but hey, it seems to work. 
but also because I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with people enjoying their craft. There's nothing wrong with that. It's like a singer, you know? A singer. I love music, and I think singers are really smart. With that being said, even if I get famous someday, and all of a sudden my band, which, by the way, it's not a big band at all so far, makes it big time, and I make lots of money, great. I will never think of myself of automatically having everything I say be correct just because I said it. And that's the problem with these pathological people. They are pathological. That's why you see them push transgender issues on children. Because first off, most of them are controlled by people as corrupt as Kennedy. And guys, I don't have time to show you it, but you should watch the movie um, that was recently made about, I think it's called Chadwick or something like that, about one of the Kennedys. The fact of the matter is this, the Kennedys are one of the most disgusting groups of people there are. I will leave you with a clip of Stephen Molyneux talking about this, but the Kennedys were heavily involved in Hollywood, and they were kind of the foundation of what Hollywood is today. When you really think about it, think about how many failed marriages have been in Hollywood. Think about how many times people have gotten divorced in Hollywood. Think about the kind of people that these are. These people who push for to let, in, to let in migrants, who, by the way, are not refugees. They did not come here escaping war. Most of them are just economic refugees. They push all of us common people who have to live with these people to accept them with no assimilation, with no following the laws, despite the fact that they live in guarded and mostly majority white neighborhoods that are gated off from the rest of the world. This is the reason why so many people don't like people like Hillary Clinton. She doesn't live in the real world, and this is the corruption of fame. When fame comes from something that isn't tangible, that is more subjective than anything else, from acting, from quote-unquote arts, and it doesn't come from something real, then it's very easy to corrupt someone. Like I said, if I, my band ever gets big, I will always try to do things myself. I'll, I'll build a lot of my own furniture. I'll, 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 I'll weld a lot of my own house and its own utensils and whatever I have there. You know, I'll try to do things on my own to keep myself humble. And I'll try to make sure that I save most of my money and I invest it in projects to help people. But the fact of the matter is this. I want you guys all to just quickly think about this. Everyone in Hollywood constantly says that people like me are paranoid. Okay. Years ago, the entire issue was about, you know, when it came to gay rights, just letting people be themselves. And guess what? Most gay people, I'll even, you can even look up V talking about this. Most gay people who went to pride parades were right-wing Republicans who just said, yeah, just let us be ourselves. They were nicely dressed. They were loud. They were happy, but they were also respectful. They were nice to everyone. They talked to everyone really, really nicely. That's who they were, and most of them were wealthy, too. Now look at it. There are pictures of young children twerking. Children should not be sexualized. They shouldn't be. So many things have become political. The NFL are huge gun control shills. Amy Schumer getting up and now telling people, you can't say what I used to say. In fact, Sarah Silverman openly saying, well, it was okay when I did it, but now that you guys are doing fill in the blank, whatever kind of dirty joke they want, you can't do it. They always start small. And then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it affects people like you and me every single day. That's why I will also be following this video up with a video about a fantastic movie called Out of the Furnace. Like I said, I don't have a problem with these people being admired. I don't have a problem with these people getting paid to hone a craft like, you know, acting. What I have a problem with is when they think that that makes people who work in the steel mill, who, you know, live in reality, in the reality where if you don't work hard, you go home and you starve. The people who live in the flyover states, which is one of the most insulting things you could talk, say about states like Wisconsin, um, Washington, Kentucky, um, um, Kansas, Texas, well, uh, Texas isn't really a flyover state, but whatever, you know, um, Montana, um, Michigan, 
You know, all these industry states, all these states that make their freaking cars, that make their iPhones. The Auto Furnace explores how so many people get up on stage and there are all these famous people. They all live in Hollywood in this affluent area where they're totally disconnected from the real world. And they openly laugh at people like you and like me. And they say that we're stupid hillbilly rednecks for wanting to protect our culture, for wanting to protect our economies, for wanting to give our kids futures, and yet they don't have to deal with any of the stuff we do. So ladies and gentlemen, here's Stefan Molyneux really ripping into these people the way you should, the way we all should, because here's the thing. If someone famous out there thinks that everyone has a different viewpoint and we need to consider the merits of those viewpoints, they're okay in my book. If there's someone like Amy Schumer, though, who just looks at anyone who disagrees with her and says, I don't think that I've ever met someone who doesn't like Hillary Clinton who had anything meaningful to say. And they openly advocate that we let kids dress and drag before they even understand what their penis is. That is disgusting. And that is why fame should be shamed when it is used irresponsibly. My name is Arsene and I am the Angel of Objectivism, signing off. I've had an astonishing experience uh, just going to see the movie Chappaquiddick, diving into it and diving deep into a, a Darwinian, Nietzschean, Hegelian, heart of darkness, will to power challenge to my very core. And I'm telling you, I'm this close to the religious faith of my youth for reasons that I will get into. So this is going to be a little bit about Chappaquiddick uh, and the movie. It's going to be a little bit more about Chappaquiddick, the actual uh, incident. And um, let us uh, let us dive in. It's powerful, powerful stuff for me. So everybody knows the Kennedys. There was this Joe Kennedy who made his fortune, family fortune, some pretty unsavory ways, though I guess not for libertarians. And he had a bunch of sons. Uh, one, I think, died uh, in, uh, in, in wartime. There was John F. Kennedy, of course, shot uh, in Dallas. There was Robert Kennedy shot. Uh, and then there was a Ted Kennedy was the last of the surviving brothers. And he had presidential ambitions, I guess. The toothy fascism of the Kennedys was this giant wave that uh, was, I guess, that generation's Clintons, though, perhaps with uh, slightly fewer bodies. I mean, Kennedy never had to work a day in his life. He um, never had a real job. And he, like a lot of leftists, he spent his entire life telling other hardworking people at the point of a gun how they should spend their money, which we'll get into later. But, I mean, he was raised in privilege, went to the usual exclusive boarding prep schools, went on to Harvard, but ended up being expelled from Harvard because he persuaded another undergraduate to take his Spanish exams for him. Bit of a warning to the voters, but hey, you know, if you're willing to give free stuff to voters, well, they'll let you... Maybe they won't let you get away with murder, but it seems they'll let you get away with manslaughter, which we'll, we'll get into. Now, remember all the Roy Moore stuff? Oh, 16-year-old girl, 17-year-old girl, 18-year-old girl, whatever it was. Well, Kennedy was a drunk for a good portion of his life and certainly for a good portion of his career in the Senate. Could reek and drunk. He reeked of drink at 9 o'clock in the morning, bawling, roaring drunk at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in one of Washington's top restaurants, Ted Kennedy once threw a waitress over a table in a private room and tried to mount her and have sex with her. There's a congressional aide who was 16, told of being propositioned by Kennedy from the back seat of his limousine in Capitol Hill. She said that she testified that Ted Kennedy leaned out of the window, waved a wine bottle and asked whether she or a friend she was with wanted to join him. Because, you know, it's terrible. I mean, it is terrible. That is awful, appalling behavior. He's married, I assume so. Now, we'll get to Chappaquiddick, but uh, just to skip over it for a sec, um, William Kennedy Smith, I assume that's uh, the reference from the Tragically Hip song, football Kennedy style. There, one of the Kennedys was accused of date rape in, in 1991. So the Kennedy clan, the Kennedy men, gathered at the family's Winter at Beach House in Florida, and this William Kennedy Smith, who was Ted's nephew, was accused of taking a young woman named Patricia Bauman on the beach late at night and forcing her to have sex against her will. 
there was a big complicated defense, which takes the kinds of OJ expensive lawyers that the Kennedys can afford. He was found not guilty because he said it was rough but consensual sex. And Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, like a kraken, like a beast from the depths, like a, a satyr, arises, like emerges in this uh, trial. Uh, witnesses testified that Ted Kennedy was lounging around in his boxer shorts as his nephew coaxed the young woman onto the beach and did nothing to intervene the rough sex slash date rape, as she claimed. And Kennedy was, had woken the younger men in his party and insisted they go out to a nightclub to hunt for women. So uh, the man was a vile pig uh, at just about every conceivable dimension. And uh, just to point it out about the movie, it is quite fascinating to see how hard it is to bring democratic scandals and criticisms to the big screen. Again, it's just part of the whole leftist Democrat bias in Hollywood. I mean, George W. Bush, uh, man, since his election in 2000, there's a whole bunch of movies that came out pretty negative. There was W, uh, Recount, Fair Game, Truth, Fahrenheit, 9-11. So, yeah, it's quite a lot of stuff about the Bushes. Uh, not, no movie about former President Bill Clinton's impeachment, the incredible rake ap accusations against him, his affair with Monica Lewinsky. No movie about Democrat FDR's internment of the Japanese. <sighs> no movies about... Lyndon Johnson's horrifying mishandling of the Vietnam War. And, I don't know, uh, how about Woodrow Wilson, who was a racist and pretty close to fascism, lied America into World War I and tried almost single-handedly to destroy the First Amendment. So this just shows you that it's real hard to get stuff critical of leftists uh, or Democrats onto the big screen, so kudos to the movies. Uh, to the movie makers for, for doing that. And it is a good film. You should go and see the film. It is like a weird alien fly-on-the-wall documentary into an amoral universe called hell itself. And it's well, well worth watching. So we'll talk a little bit about Chappaquiddick that occurred in 1969. And uh, it's a horrifying series of events. You can tell, of course, when you have a pro-Kennedy or pro-Democrat, which I guess at the time was pretty similar, kind of reporter. They'll always refer to it as a tragedy, and they'll always reference his dead brothers and all that kind of stuff. But let's go over some of the basics, because that's important and a powerful story about life in an amoral universe with no God, no conscience. Uh, it is a terrifying universe, and one I do not know how to rescue the world from without God. So this is part of the glow that surrounds me at the moment, and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in all that. So there was a party on Chappaquiddick, which is a small island off Edgartown in, in Massachusetts. I think it's pretty near Martha's Vineyard. And on this island, there was a rented cottage, and there's a party. And the party has six unmarried, hot young women, and six, I think they were all married, married men. And there was a cookout, and there was drinks, and everybody slept over. Come on. You don't have to be Mike Pence to understand that that's a weird situation. Why are all these married men going to a sleepover party with drinks with six hot, young, unmarried girls? <sighs> well, this is the amoral universe uh, of satisfy your physical lusts, whatever they manifested. Kennedy's cousin, Joseph A. Gargan, he shows up a lot in the movie, he was at this party and he stated that all those at the party were a little bombed, he said, except for Ray LaRosa. So Kennedy, as socialists generally do, spent his day at a regatta sailing his yacht and, and trying to win a race. He didn't. And so he shows up at the party, and long story short, he had a like, He doesn't drive himself much, right? His, his license had actually expired. So there was a driver. He had a driver, a chauffeur, at the party. Now what happened was, according to Kennedy, that this woman, Mary Jo Kopechny, she came to him and she said, I'm not feeling well, can you drive me back to my hotel? Or if you're going anyway, can you whatever, right? So Kennedy has a driver. Why don't you get in the car with the driver and drive on back if you want to help this young woman out? Or oh, there were other people she could have found. Now Kennedy says, oh, my, Crimmins, I think his name, my, my chauffeur, well, he was still eating. 
So I didn't want to disturb him, so I just figured out, well, I'll drive back. Okay, well, fine. So no one saw them leave. She didn't tell her friends she was going anywhere, which is kind of weird, right? I mean, you go, you're, you're having a reunion with your friends. You haven't seen them in a long time. You were involved in, I think they were involved in RFK's aborted presidential bid, and they were doing all this uh, research. She helped write some speeches about a smart girl.